Michael Gillen earned an equivalent of three PhDs from Cornell University in Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy. A three-time Emmy Award winner, he served as the science correspondent for ABC News. Michael is the host of the History Channel series, Where Did It Come From? A best-selling author and producer of the award-winning film, Little Red Wagon. He is the chairman and president of the Philanthropy Project, Spectacular Science Productions Incorporated, and Philanthropy Media. Please welcome Michael Gillen. Well, good morning. You can do better than that. Good morning. Good, ah, now we're talking, now we're talking, now we're talking. Uh, I gotta warn you, I'm, I'm feeling a little mischievous this morning. Uh, you know, the, uh, the good folks at RTB put the fear of God into all of us speakers and say you have to speak for only 30 minutes and not a second more. And, I, and, and then my mischievous mind says, yeah, and they have a countdown clock here like at NASA, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking, all right, oh, uh, what could possibly happen to me if I go a little bit long? And, and, I'm, and I'm picturing Hugh back there with a long hook, you know, and this is like, or, or worse than that, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Kathy, you know, Ross storming the stage and chasing me off, or, or maybe a trap door will open up and I'll just fall out of sight or something like that. Well, we'll find out, okay? Just depends on how mischievous I'm willing to be. I've always been a little mischievous. Those of you who know me uh, know what I'm talking about. But speaking about hypotheticals, when I was invited and I accepted to, to speak here, this is my first time at, at AMP, and I'm really excited about it, um, uh, I thought to myself, well, why, why would you all come here? And, and, and in some cases from considerable distances, yesterday I met somebody from Arizona, a couple from Texas, uh, a lovely lady from Alabama. Can anybody beat that? I mean, anybody farther than that? Yes? Florida? Can anybody beat Florida? I hear Florida. Can I? <laughs> Atlanta, yeah. So, Canada. All right, my brother. What? Cameroon. Okay, that's it. We're shutting it down. He wins. I, I don't think anybody can beat Cameroon. God bless you, brother. Welcome, 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 welcome. So anyway, um, so I'm thinking, okay, why would they come here? What are they expecting? And then I started thinking, well, why am I here? I mean, why, why would I even accept this invitation to speak? And, um, and I'll tell you in a minute why. But before I do, I want to eliminate some possible reasons, right? Let's get those out of the way. I am not here to defend anything. I'm not here to defend a point of view. I'm not here to defend the faith. I'm not even here to defend the truth. Now, before you storm out and, and demand a refund or start throwing tomatoes at me, just bear with me for a moment. And remember what Charles Spurgeon said. He was that wonderful uh, British preacher, and he said, truth is like a lion. It does not need defending. You just simply need to set it free and it will defend itself. So I don't stand up here to presume to defend anything, not even the truth. I'm also not here to prove anything. Now, I'm a scientist, and so people expect me to prove things, but there's this huge misconception that science is in the business of proving things. Science can't prove anything. Science is, in the, is the business of probing, not proving. Now, math is a different story. Um, math, you can prove things. And in some cases, you can prove some pretty amazing sounding things. So, for example, if I said to you, uh, all triangles, whether they're long and skinny and thin, or short, squat, and fat, all triangles, if you add up the interior angles, add up to 180 degrees. That's, that's Pretty remarkable, right? That's a, that's a pretty remarkable assertion. It's not intuitive, and yet I can prove it. I've proven it many, many times. I first proved it in high school. And there are probably people in here who could prove it as well. So math can prove things. Math can even go one step further 
and not only prove something, but prove that your proof is unique. It's called a uniqueness proof. That your solution to a problem is not only true, but it is the only true solution. So math is very powerful in that regard. Physics, science is a whole different beast. It cannot prove anything. And, and one of the quotes that I love from Albert Einstein says it all, and he said, no amount of evidence can ever prove me right. A single experiment can prove me wrong. Do you understand the difference? See, in science, we are not in the business of proving anything. And, and if people try to tell you that, including people like Richard Dawkins, they're just blowing sunshine. They can't prove anything. They can make a convincing argument, but they can't prove anything. So I just wanted to get that out. And, and it's interesting because I often say that we are the, the only creatures on the face of the earth that can prove things that are hard to believe and believe things that are hard to prove. Now that's a whole different lecture, maybe next year. But, but I just thought I'd throw that out there for your consideration. Finally, I am not here to, on the chance that there are non-Christians in this audience, and I really hope that there are, I was told most of you are already Christians, but I really hope that there are people here who are not Christians. But on the chance that there are, I just want to assure you I'm not here to convert you. Anyway, I don't have that power. Um, only the Holy Spirit has the power to convert somebody's heart and somebody's mind. So, I've told you all the things that I'm not here to do, and you're probably wondering, all right, well, why are you here? <laughs> well, I am here simply to share a few highlights from my lifelong quest for truth. in the hopes that some of the things I've discovered along the way, some of the truths that I've discovered along the way will help you in your own quest for truth because I hope you are on a quest for truth. I, I assume you are, otherwise you wouldn't be here. I credit you for being here on a Saturday morning, good grief. So that's why I'm here. And I have 30 minutes and now I have like less than that. <laughs> But we'll see. <laughs> What's the worst thing that can happen? They won't invite me next year. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, my quest for truth began in East Los Angeles. Yes, that's right. Some of us are really born in East LA, not just Cheech and Chong, <laughs> who I think are fakers. I'm not sure that they ever were born in East LA, but I really was. I'm the real deal. I, was born on Townsend, just off of First Street, actually in a house. You know, not in a hospital, in a house. Yes, those were the days when doctors made house calls. <sighs> wow. Um, <laughs> and um, I can remember very clearly in the second grade, so that would make me, what, seven years old? Um, I, I had the desire, the burning, passionate desire to be a gangbanger. No, not really. <laughs> you, you wouldn't want to hear from me then. No, no. I had this passion to become a scientist. Now, you, you have to understand how remarkable that is because I never met a scientist. I never stepped foot in a university. East Los Angeles. It's not like, you know, scientists are walking the sidewalks and you, 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 you have chance meetings with them. No, not at all. I grew up in a Spanish-speaking house for the most part. But I just, and I dreamt. I mean, when I said, when I say to you, I, I dreamed of becoming a scientist, I mean, I literally dreamed it. I dreamt myself in a white lab coat winning the Nobel Prize. Oh, well. Uh, well, there's still time. There's still time. Uh, and, um, and I'd never been in a lab. And, you know, those were the days before computers. So it's not like I had Googled it and the Google images and I could see what a lab was. But there it was. And that dream carried me from East LA to UCLA to Cornell, ultimately to Harvard. But what I want to talk to you about is what happened at Cornell for a few minutes, okay? A few of my precious 30 minutes. Uh, uh, gee. 
I'm already getting nervous. You know, I think, I, I, I think I'm going long, but anyway. So there I am. I, I, I'll never forget the day that I said goodbye to my family and friends at LAX, and I winged my way to New York City and then took a bus to Ithaca, New York. And if you look at a map, I could not have possibly gotten further. This is LA, <laughs> this is Ithaca, New York. I mean, I could, it's a diagonal. I could not have gotten farther from my roots. And I instantly became a scientific monk. And my wife is here in the audience to uh, confirm what I'm telling you. When I say I'm, I, I became a scientific monk, I mean it. I, I slept maybe about three hours a day. Typically, I would uh, get up at six in the morning um, I would go to my lab, which was in the basement of the Lab of Nuclear Studies uh, at Cornell, and I would simply hole up there the entire day, and maybe at 3 a.m. or so, I would head over to my little dorm room and then get three hours of sleep, and I'd start all over again. I didn't eat well, I didn't dress well, I had a big afro, not because I, I was into style or anything like that, but because I just didn't care. I only cared about science. And, um, and then a funny thing happened. Uh, I asked a simple question. I've always asked questions. My, my middle school math teacher called me Michael Jillian because I was always asking a jillion questions. <laughs> but I just asked a simple question. During my, my, my scientific monk days at Cornell, high above Cayuga's waters, I asked a very simple question. And here's the question. How did this all come to be? I've spent my, my life studying how the universe works from the smallest scale to the largest scale. So how did it all come to be? I was well aware from the classes I had taken and all the reading and studying I'd already done that this was a magnificent universe. This is not like a hollow rabbit. You know, we're, we're coming on Easter and you buy these beautiful foil wrapped bunnies and you go home and you break, it's hollow, there's nothing there. Well, the universe could have been that way, right? It could have been like that foil-wrapped hollow rabbit that the more you look at it, the more disappointed you become. That it's all superficial beauty, but there's nothing inside. But what I was discovering as a student of science was just the opposite. That the external beauty, as magnificent as it is, is nothing compared to the inner beauty of the universe. So how did it all come to be? Simple question, legitimate question. I wasn't a man of faith at that point, so for me, the thesis that somehow it was created by some superior being wasn't, wasn't an option for me. It just didn't fit into my down-to-earth way of thinking at the time. And so where do I find it? Well, at the time that I was there, Carl Sagan was becoming very famous, and I remember hearing him blabbering about the Vedas. Vedas this, the Vedas that, blah, blah, blah. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I can seek answers outside of science because science was offering me an answer that I just didn't buy, which is that it all happened by chance. And we can have a discussion about what I mean by that exactly. It's actually a fascinating discussion, but it would take me more than 30 minutes. <laughs> you might want to talk to Hugh and Kathy about that. Okay, now, uh, because it, it, it has, especially now, it's become very, very popular to talk about the, the instability of nothingness and, and how the universe creates itself. So that was the answer that science was offering me, that it all happened by chance. But for me, it seemed like just a cop-out. To me, it was uh, to say that the universe came out of nothingness, i.e. the quantum vacuum, was kind of like saying that it was created by God. It was just kind of like too magical. And so I said, okay, well, if science can't provide a, a, a reasonable answer to my simple question, where can I find possibly an answer, and this is when I remember Sagan blabbering about the Vedas, and so I, it was before Google, so I went to the library and I looked it up, aha, the Hindu literature, and I immersed myself. I never do anything halfway, so I just immersed, I became a Hindu, and uh, no, not really, but I really just, I was fascinated by 
the Hindu religion, and then I, I didn't stop there. I thought, well, I started reading the I Ching, and then I, the more of the Buddhist literature, and I found it very, very interesting, and I immersed myself in the Buddhist. And then my thesis advisor was Jewish, so he would take me to temple on Friday nights, and I learned how to love chopped chicken livers. I never loved liver. My mom tried to feed me liver, but Professor Leboff's mother's chopped chicken liver, to this day, I'm telling you, it's making me hungry. So we would go to temple, Shabbat services on a Friday night, and then we'd go back to Richard's house, and he would serve me the chopped chicken liver. So I immersed myself in the Torah. At that time, Transcendental Meditation International was very, very popular. Gurus were making the rounds at the universities. They said you could even levitate yourself, and it was all quite fascinating. So I was into all of this, and then this undergraduate girl named Laurel, entered my life. And I don't have the time to tell you how that happened, but it was pretty supernatural. And she said to me, as I told her about my wishing to find an answer to my simple question, how did it all come to be? She said, well, have you read the Bible? And I'm like, what? I grew up hearing about the Bible. It just didn't seem exotic enough. It didn't seem interesting. It seemed prosaic to me. And so I had kind of avoided it. I just didn't think it was that interesting. But then, you know, I, uh, she said, well, if you read it, I'll read it with you. Now, look, I'm not as dumb as I look. She's a beautiful girl, and she was from Kappa Kappa Gamma, which was famous for its beautiful girls on campus. And I thought, all right, well, she's going to read them with me. I'll do it. It took us two years to read the Bible from beginning to end. And along the way, we had a million questions because she's like me, very curious, inquisitive, seeking truth. And so she would have a question. Well, I said, write it down. And we had a spiral notebook and we would fill that thing up. And we said, well, we'll, we'll revisit that question, but let's move on because it's never, anyway, we're going to be dead before we even finish this thing. <laughs> so uh, now listen. It was like somebody had switched on the lights. I don't have time, but what struck me, especially, yes, through the Old Testament, but into the New Testament, what struck me was, I'm like, wait a minute. I've seen these truths before. The truths being espoused in the Bible, I, those are familiar to me. I've, I've seen them. I've been learning them in my classrooms at the graduate school here at Cornell. And so I got really excited. I'm like, whoa. And I hadn't, I hadn't recognized this in other religions. You know, even things like linear time versus circular time. And, and there was just some really things that just jumped out at me. And so I became very excited. And over the years, I compared the truths that were being espoused in the Bible with the truths that were being espoused by modern science, the truths that I was being taught by my professors at Cornell that I was teaching myself through my own self-study. And many, many years later, my wife, my manager, and my literary agent ganged up on me and they said, well, why don't you write them down? I mean, why don't you write down these truths that you find both in the Bible and in science, these parallel truths, these confluent truths? And I wrote it, and I wrote this book. It's called, Ama funny that, it's called Amazing Truths, How Science and the Bible Agree. It's exactly what it is. That's what I discovered. Now, there are 10 truths in here, because 10 is the perfect number. You know, the Pythagoreans, the, the Pythagoreans thought 10 was the perfect number. In Chinese, ancient Chinese culture, too, 10 is the perfect number. So, and the publisher said, we'll put in 10. I could have I written many more. There are many more than just 10 truths that both modern science and the Bible agree on. I'm talking about big truths here. I'm not talking about little weeny little truths, like, you know, the sky is blue or what. I'm talking about fundamental truths that are the foundation of anyone's worldview. It didn't have to be that way. I mean, you're talking about a Bible which is thousands of years old, and you're comparing it to the worldview being offered to us by the latest science, and you're saying to me that they agree on all the fundamental truths? It doesn't seem real. And yet it is. And I document it in the book. 
I also add a lot of, I spice it up with adventures that I've had as a TV correspondent. I've been to the North Pole, the South Pole, I've been to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, seen the Titanic. So, that, so I spice it up to keep you going, to keep you awake. But I don't think I needed to do that because I think just the truths by themselves are pretty amazing. Now, I, again, I don't have time to go into, but I'm going to do one. Okay, just preview it for you because I think you'll find this interesting. What does science and the Bible have to say about truth, absolute truth? Since we're talking about truth, that would be an important thing to know, right? What does science and the Bible have to say about the existence of absolute truth? Does it exist or doesn't it? That's a fundamental question. Well, let's look at science first. Let's see what science has to say. Science does believe in absolute truth. Science believes in the existence of absolute truth. Newsflash. Because if it didn't, think about it. What's the point? Then why are you a scientist? If you're not seeking truths about the universe, then what are you doing except just wasting your time? So right off the bat, science believes in absolute truth. Let me illustrate it this way. You know the famous Galileo experiment, which may or may not be true, but the Leaning Tower piece, of, right, where he dropped a rock and a feather. He, we don't think he really did that, but that's beside the point. What I want you to do is what I call a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment, okay? I want you to imagine 10 of us, 10 of us at the top of the, uh, let's make it the Empire State Building. And on the count of three, we're all going to jump off. Now, let, let, let's not take into consideration air because air always messes up problems. Let's just say so it's airless community. It, no friction. Not, so for you, for you real pinheads out there, don't be bothering me about, you know, uh, friction due to air, okay? So we, one, two, three, boom, we jump. My question is, at what rate do we fall? Science says it's, we all fall at the same rate with the same acceleration, 32 feet per second per second, or 10 meters per second per second if you want to do metric, right? So that's it. So it's not like, okay, person number one falls at one rate, person number two falls at another rate, person, it doesn't matter if you're fat or thin, old or young, white, brown, yellow, red, it doesn't matter. There's one law of gravity. Newton himself found was the first to codify the law of gravity, and it's called universal law of gravity for a reason. What does the word universal mean? It means there is one law for everybody. There isn't a law of gravity for you, my friend, and there isn't a law of gravity for you, and there isn't a different law of gravity for you or a different law of gravity for you. There is one universal law of gravity, and we all have to submit to its authority. I see, that is an absolute truth. You may think when you fall off that I'm different. My truth is different than your truth, and so I'm going to fly. Good luck with that one. There is one and only one law of gravity, and we all have to submit to its authority. So what does the Bible have to say about this? What does the Bible have to say about absolute truth? It agrees. And in particular, for example, the Bible says there is one God, one universal God to whom we all submit to. There isn't a God for you, there isn't a God for you, there isn't a God for you, and there isn't a God for you. You may think so, but that doesn't make it so. The Bible says there is one universal God. So whether you agree with it or not, here we have a perfect example of how, the science, how science and the Bible agree on the existence of absolute truth. This is very significant, so I want to spend a few of my precious remaining minutes dwelling on this. Because look, when somebody says to you, yeah, but the Bible and science, you know, they're, they're at odds, they're incompatible. Here's an example you can give them. Here's an example where the Bible actually defends 
scientific point of view. Science believes in absolute truth, and the Bible comes along science and says, you know what, we agree with science. The Bible comes along science and says, we agree with science. And they stand, they stand together against what? They stand together against postmodern relativism, don't they? So here we have a beautiful example of how not only, do the, not only does science and the Bible agree, but they're in agreement against a prevailing worldview today, which is relativism. You see, the mistake postmodern relativists make is that they, and they will often say this, they will often invoke the special theory of relativity to defend their point of view. They say, well, Einstein discovered that, you know, the world is relative. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. What he did say was that there were qualities of the universe, there were descriptors of the universe, there were properties of the universe that were relative, in particular space and time. So you and I, if we're in different reference frames from different points of view, we'll argue about the length of a ruler. You'll say it's six inches long, and I'll say it's 12 inches long. So Einstein said, yes, that kind of disagreement is, does exist in the universe. We will disagree over length, and we will also disagree over time. You will say uh, a tick of a clock may last a half hour to you. A tick of a clock may only last 15 seconds to me. So we can disagree over space and time. But the fundamental laws of the universe, we can't disagree on. It's what we call Lorentz covariant or Lorentz symmetric, okay? The laws of physics Einstein discovered, even in the special theory of relativity, the laws themselves, not the descriptors, not the, not the superficial qualities of the universe, but the fundamental laws that make the universe work, those are Lorentz covariant. They are universal. They are absolute. They are not relative. So to use that language, the Bible says the same thing. The Bible, in effect, says the laws of the spiritual universe are, are Lorentz covariant. They're universal. They're absolute truths. It would say God is Lorentz covariant. There is one God for everybody, absolute. So whereas the relatives will say, no, everything about the universe is relative, science and the Bible are united in saying, no, you're wrong. Absolute truths do exist. And among those absolute truths, are the laws of the physical universe and the laws of the spiritual universe and God himself. That's a big deal. The other nine truths that I talk about here have to do with what does science and the Bible have to say about time? What does science and the Bible have to say about logic and proof? Um, what does God have to say about um, we humans? And in every case, you find this en enormous agreement between the two. And that's why we called it Amazing Truths. So now, in my remaining three minutes, unless I ex decide to be a little mischievous, <laughs> I want to say something to you. I, I compare my quest for truth, your quest for truth, anyone's quest for truth, I compare it to a prospector looking for gold. Because both are precious and rare. Truths and gold are precious and rare. They're hard to find. You can't just sit in your armchair like the scholastics once upon a time wished to do and just divine truth. Yes, you can have, I believe in revelatory truth, but for the most part, you have to work at it. And I compare our minds to a treasure chest. And the question is, what's inside your treasure chest? For some people, it's empty. And I don't, I don't mean that pejoratively. I mean, it's just, it, there, there, isn't, there are no absolute truths in their treasure chest, in their minds. I guess maybe they're relativists. So there are no absolute truths. They, they, it, it's like having a GPS that says, you know, turn left in 10 feet. Or you can turn right in 50 feet. It's up to you. I mean, really, that's the life of a relativist, right? There are no absolute directions. There's nothing to navigate by that's absolutely true. 
It's all just up to you. You're winging it. Okay? Some people in their minds, in their treasure chest, and, and maybe this is even worse, I'm thinking, have things that they think are absolute truths, but that are really not. They're fool's gold. And I think of that as being in like a hall of mirrors, trying to navigate through a hall of mirrors. And you think you're, being navig you're navigating by certain absolute truths, but they're not. You're going to be bumping into a lot of glass. You're going to be misdirected. And I think that's just as bad as just not believing in absolute truth at all. But some of you, I think most of you in this room, when you look inside your mind, there are, there are quite a few absolute truths. Truths that some are big and some are small. But these are truths that you've tested. Right? You test for gold. One of the tests is, is it soft? And you don't just test them once and then just store them in your mind. You've got to keep testing them. Right? But for those of you who are blessed enough to have encountered, found truths, absolute truths that help you navigate through life. My final piece of advice is this. Don't let the gold go to your head. Don't be a know-it-all. For one thing, it's no way to win friends and influence people, being a know-it-all. Nobody likes a know-it-all. And besides, it's dishonest, because the one thing that both the science and the Bible agree is that we live in a world of uncertainty. It's not just a human condition. It's, the, the, the state of uncertainty is not just a human state. It is in the fabric of the universe. Heisenberg proved that in the 1920s. Gödel proved that in the 1930s. And more recently, Edward Lorenz at MIT and otherwise through the, the principles of chaos theory have proven to us that uncertainty is in the very fabric of the universe. So to go around being a know-it-all, pretending like you have all the answers and you have it all together, it's phony. And you're going to not only put people off, but you're going to be a fake. You're going to be a fake. The fact is, a genuine quest for truth leads to wisdom. And that wisdom is this that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And that quest for truth, if it's genuine, and you've tested the truths in your mind over and over and over again, will lead you one day past this life into the next, and you will come face to face with the only true know-it-all in the universe, God Himself, the source of all absolute truth. God bless you and thank you. And no trapdoor. I'm